Today I would like to talk about logical fallacies. If you've never discussed logical fallacies, you're probably having a serious what moment. Alright, so I'm going to try to break this down for you. When you are writing an argument, or presenting an argument, you need to be logical, <laughs> which means the things you say actually kind of need to make sense, right? In the most basic form of logic, you would say, okay, A plus B equals C. That's nice. That's so abstract right now that we don't really have any idea what you're talking about, though. So when you're talking about cause and effect, then you need to make sure that if two things occur, that the third thing really is the result. All right, and there are a couple of different ways that you can handle logic in a paper, but I'm going to try to be brief. So I'm not gonna, I could talk about this for hours. I'm not gonna do that to you. So let's discuss logical fallacies. So if you generate a logical fallacy, it means you messed up. You made a mistake in your logic. I'm not gonna lie to you. People do this on purpose all the time. I don't think I will surprise you when I say that the realm of politics is a place where people will purposefully confuse you. They want to win the argument no matter what. And I'm not saying all politicians are like this, I'm just saying we all know in the history of the world, in every country, there has been at least one politician who has purposefully obscured the logic or purposely used a logical fallacy so that they can win. Because unfortunately, humans are really prone to illogical thinking. And to a certain extent, it just has to do with the way our brains are put together. Our brains are trying to make sense of the world as fast as they can. And unfortunately, sometimes that causes us to think that something will cause something else when it doesn't. So a logical fallacy that is connected to this phenomenon is called post hoc ergo propter hoc. Okay, that's great, what? All right, this is a Latin phrase. All it's trying to say is something happened and something followed from it, but these two things that happened by each other seem to make this third thing happen, so you jump to the conclusion that they did. This is basically the basis for all superstitious thinking. A black cat walked across my path, so I had bad luck the rest of the day. No, a random cat just walked across your path. You know, that, that had nothing to do with anything. Or, let me use this completely ridiculous example. So, someone says, Hey, I noticed every single summer, the amount of ice cream that's sold increases greatly. And I also noticed that the number of drownings that occur increase exponentially. So, it's only logical to assume that ice cream causes drownings. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> no. So, just because two things occur at the same time does not mean that one causes the other. And if you say that they do, then you would be committing this logical fallacy. And you just stop and think, okay, so what other reasons might there be that these two things are happening simultaneously? And, you know, we have a very long world history of people jumping to conclusions, whether it's for superstitious thinking or something else. That's why as I was also a psychology major. In the world of psychology, I was told as a student, correlation does not imply causation. In other words, just because two events happen together or correlate does not mean that one caused the other. All right, another logical fallacy, poisoning the well. In this case, what you're, you're doing, you're absolutely doing on purpose before the other side can even begin to express their position, you jump in and say something bad about them. You're poisoning the well. You're like, oh, don't listen to that person. He cheats on his wife. I'm sorry, what? Well, I mean, that's nice, but he's trying to talk about, you know, bus safety. Whether he is, you know, in a good marriage with his wife and whether he's cheating on his wife or not has absolutely nothing to do with bus safety. You know, you poison the well, you try to make the, you know, the other side just, you're trying to blow them away before they can even talk by saying mean things about them. Um, and this basic category is also the straw man argument. This is, again, you're, you're punching through too fast. You're saying, uh, somebody says, okay, so I like sushi more 
then I like hamburgers. And the other person goes, oh, so you hate hamburgers then. I see how it is. And you're like, wait, what? Like, you set up this ridiculous argument, and then you just knock the person over like they're made out of straw. You know, you, you really, like, smacked much too hard. You know, it is not ethical. This is an issue of ethics. Um, another one in this basic kind of overall category of fallacies, uh, the genetic fallacy. In other words, you said, kind of similar to what I said for poisoning the well, you said, oh, well, I mean, that guy, you can't take his argument seriously. And someone's like, but why not? And you're like, because of who he is. Okay, that's fine. Who is he exactly? He's the guy that stole a million dollars from his church. But he's not talking about church, he's talking about um, the safety of the local high school. You know, he wants metal detectors in our high school. Yeah, but he stole a million dollars. Okay, I'm sorry, but those two things have nothing to do with each other right now. You need to evaluate his logic for why you need to add metal detectors in the local high school and need to ignore for a moment that he's guilty of a major crime. You know, I'm not saying, hey, it's awesome, he's guilty of a crime. I'm saying it doesn't matter right now. We're not talking about money being stolen from an organization. We're talking about whether or not we need metal detectors. These two things are not related. So his DNA or his genetics as a person are not involved in the discussion about whether the high school needs metal detectors or not. The genetic fallacy. I'm sure that you can think of cases of at least one of these that you've actually heard in real life because they're actually happening all the time all around you. All right, so if you're saying as a scholar and a scholarly paper, you really need to make sure your logic makes sense and you should make sure that you're being ethical. Well, then what are you doing? I mean, a couple of things. One thing is to make sure that, you know, if you say A plus B really does equal C, that you've checked the cause and effect and it's accurate. You will notice that a lot of scientific articles will avoid cause and effect language for this very reason. They're not actually sure yet what the cause is, so they're not just going to go, hey, this totally causes this other thing. They will not say that until they have done so many decades worth of experiments that they are 100% positive there is no other explanation. So we should be really, really careful if they're being ethical as scientists. All right, other things. Let's say you're going to create an analogy. You're going to compare two things. All right, you need to make sure in the course of your argument, if you say this one thing is like this other thing, that that's actually true. One way you can throw an argument is to use an analogy that doesn't actually fully work. And if you use kind of a weighted analogy in your favor, you know, you're making people turn on the other side, but you're actually comparing apples with oranges. If you're going to make it a comparison, it needs to be an apple to an apple and an orange to an orange. And that is the name of another fallacy, apples and oranges. Now, if you're going to build an analogy or, analogy or comparison of any kind, you need to make sure these two things are actually equal. They deserve to be in the, a part of an analogy with each other. All right, make sure you represent the other side fairly. And I talked about this somewhat in my video about the Rogerian argument. All right, representing the other side fairly. You need to make sure that you have researched and read enough about the other position that you truly understand them. And then you can represent their side. Be ethical. Represent them fairly. Make sure when you say that they said something, that that's genuinely what they said and it's what they meant to say. Then you can address what they said and say, well, that's their solution. I think my solution will work better because, and then you can outline your solution. You know, you're not trying to rip them apart. You know, this is not like the Spartans or the Trojans or the Trojan War or whatever. You know, you're not trying to go out and conquer the enemy in a scholarly argument. You're not on an actual battlefield. You need to be respectful to the other side. Represent them fairly. This will help you avoid some logical fallacies. All right? So, this is the quickest, briefest overview that I can give with a couple of pointers to go with it. And certainly I do want you to read the section in your textbook about logic and logical fallacies. The internet has many, many resources and can give you many, many more examples of logical fallacies. All you have to do is Google it. So, begin thinking about the process of being logical and ethical in your paper.